Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at a column from page number 6. This column is written by Manjeev Singh Puri, who was India's former ambassador and as well as India's lead negotiator to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This column deals with the topic of climate negotiations and climate justice. See when we talk about global warming, climate change and efforts to combat climate change, there are two essential conflicts that come up. One is the conflict between climate action and retaining space for growth and development. The other is the conflict between developed and developing countries. These conflicts exist because climate action is inversely related to growth and development if we have to fight against climate change and if we have to limit the emission of greenhouse gases then we need to switch from fossil fuels to renewable forms of energy so this approach of climate action places restrictions on the consumption of fossil fuels and the overall emissions of greenhouse gases and it also gives a push towards the adoption of cleaner and renewable forms of energy on a country but the problem is that the adoption of renewable forms of energy and limiting the consumption of fossil fuels is going to be very very expensive and this could end up derailing a country's growth and development agenda so this inverse relationship between climate action and growth and development leads to a conflict between the developed and the developing nations See the developed countries have become developed today and they have met their growth and development priorities because they have freely burned fossil fuels over the last 150 to 200 years. So the emissions of the last 150 to 200 years that these developed countries are responsible for are referred to as historical emissions. Today since climate action requires a compromise on growth and development to an extent developing and underdeveloped countries have always sought for fairness with regard to climate action and this is nothing but climate justice hence the developing and underdeveloped countries have always called upon the developed countries to be held responsible for their historical emissions and this is known as historical responsibilities this concept of historical emissions and historical responsibilities was developed through climate negotiations under the UNFCCC or the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change See the United Nations Climate Change Convention has emerged as the key platform for climate negotiations and climate action and it was born out of the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 Under the Climate Change Convention when climate negotiations were taking place the developing and the underdeveloped countries insisted that the developed world should be held accountable for their historical emissions and they should take up a higher responsibility with regard to climate action as far as their historical responsibilities are concerned this was basically a call for fairness and climate justice by the developing and the underdeveloped nations and during these climate negotiations with the leadership of india a principle known as cbdr or common but differentiated responsibilities was enshrined into the climate change negotiations According to the CBDR principle that was championed by India and other developing and underdeveloped nations the goal of fighting climate change is a common goal for all the countries of the world whereas the responsibilities should be differentiated based on the historical emissions and historical responsibilities of the respective countries such a climate action model based on the principle of CBDR would provide for climate justice and fairness and this key principle was ingrained into the first ever agreement that was signed under the climate change convention known as the kyoto protocol of 1997 the kyoto protocol became the first binding agreement under the climate change convention and it not only recognized the cbdr principle but it also took into account historical responsibilities so accordingly the goal of fighting climate change and providing for climate action was declared as a global goal a common goal but the individual responsibilities of different countries towards climate action was differentiated and this differentiation was on the basis of their historical emissions so accordingly a set of developed countries were identified under the kyoto protocol and they were given a set of legally binding targets as far as their greenhouse gas emissions were concerned and this placed a restriction on their consumption of fossil fuels 
and it provided for more carbon space for the developing and the underdeveloped nations to continue burning fossil fuels in order to meet their growth and developmental needs. At the same time, the Kyoto Protocol gave a push towards renewable energy and it also provided for several innovative solutions to finance the renewable energy initiatives of the developing countries through funding from the developed countries. It introduced concepts such as emission trading, clean development mechanism and certified emission reduction in order to facilitate this financing of developing nations by the developed countries. But throughout the negotiations of the Kyoto Protocol, what we saw was essentially a conflict between the developed world led by the United States and the European countries and the developing world largely led by India, China, Brazil and others. During these negotiations, the United States in particular rejected the concept of historical responsibilities and it wanted large developing nations such as India and China to take up equal responsibility as they had already started to emerge as one of the world's largest polluters by 1990s. While it is true that emerging economies such as India and China were increasing their greenhouse gas emissions and emerging as one of the top polluters of the world, these countries could not ignore the fact that developed countries such as the US should be held accountable for their historical emissions and it would be unfair for the developing nations to take up equal responsibility with the developed nations. Because these developing economies of the 1990s, they were still dealing with severe economic and developmental challenges and to help lift their people out of poverty and to provide for socio-economic development, these countries had to protect their right to continue burning fossil fuels for the coming years and this required them to protect their carbon space and policy space. Whereas they were justified in seeking a higher responsibility from the developed world, particularly from the US, and this conflict during the climate change negotiations led the US to never ratify the Kyoto Protocol and it stayed out of it. While this was seen as irresponsible behavior from the US, the other countries, including European countries and India, China and all the major powers, they went ahead with the Kyoto Protocol and they started living up to their respective differentiated responsibilities based on their historical emissions. But the Kyoto Protocol could never truly achieve its objectives because 1. It did not include the world's largest polluter with the highest historical responsibilities that is the United States and 2. It couldn't live up to its commitment of arranging finance from the developed countries to the developing and underdeveloped nations due to the difficulties involved in operationalizing these concepts. So despite its limitations, the Kyoto Protocol continued to operate until post-2010 and until 2015, it was the only legally binding climate agreement of the countries until the historic Paris Accord or the Paris Agreement was worked out in 2015. So the Paris Accord that was signed in 2015 became the second legally binding agreement under the Climate Change Convention after the Kyoto Protocol. But the Paris Accord completely moved away from the key principles of the Kyoto Protocol that is the principle of CBDR. In order to ensure that all the three major emitters that is US, India and China were included under the Paris Accord, the principle of CBDR was compromised and in its place a concept known as INDC was introduced. INDC stands for Intended Nationally Determined Contributions which are nothing but voluntary contributions from each country under which instead of an externally enforced binding target on greenhouse gas emissions, countries themselves would announce voluntary contributions with regard to their climate action efforts within the capacities of their economy in order to strike a balance between climate action and growth and development. But as you can see, the Paris Accord completely gave up the concept of historical responsibilities and it put in place a voluntary mechanism under which each country would define its own target and try to achieve those targets. But however, these voluntary climate action efforts have been subjected to international review and verification so as to keep a track of the progress of each country with regard to their climate action efforts. But however, it was a dilution for climate justice because it did not include the concepts of historical responsibilities and CBDR. So this accord, which did not include external legally binding targets, became acceptable to the United States as it provided for voluntary contributions 
and all the major powers came together to sign and ratify the accord including india and china thereby making the paris accord the single most important climate change agreement in order to help restrict the rise in global temperatures to under 1.5 degrees celsius by the end of the century because any temperature rise beyond this would make climate change irreversible leading to devastating consequences on the environment and as well as on human well-being but after donald trump became the president of the united states he unilaterally withdrew us from the deal because according to him climate change was a hoax theory or a conspiracy theory designed to contain america's economy and he saw the climate action responsibilities as an unfair burden on the us wherein large emitters such as india and china had been given a easier deal according to him based on these unsubstantiated arguments donald trump unilaterally withdrew the us from the paris accord thereby dealing a major blow to the climate change convention so throughout the history of climate change negotiations what we can see is that a hesitancy on the part of the united states to take up higher responsibility for its historical emissions and this has always led to conflicts between the developed and the developing nations over the topic of climate justice but however there is fresh hope of late with the change in administration in the united states because president biden has not only brought back the united states to the paris accord but he has also committed to bring the global climate change efforts back on track in this context joe biden has appointed a special envoy for climate related matters and former us secretary of state john kerry who even used to lead climate change negotiations of the united states has been appointed as a special envoy then along with this us president biden has given a call to revive the mef or the major economies forum which was an initiative that was started by the then bush administration and it had convened for the first time in 2009 the mef was basically a grouping of all the major emitters of the world and by trying to revive the mef for facilitating climate negotiations president biden has shown the willingness of the united states to be more serious about climate action then in the meantime there is a global call for pushing countries towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and many countries including china have started adopting these targets and the un secretary general has also called upon the major emitters to declare a national climate emergency within their countries in order to renew the focus of their climate action efforts and he has also called upon them to build a global coalition in order to make the global economy carbon neutral by 2050 then parallel it has been reported that the european union is considering the imposition of carbon border levies on those countries which do not take up a high reduction of their carbon emissions provided if there is no global agreement with regard to climate action such carbon border levies will basically impose a carbon tax on those countries which are not complying with the global agreement or on those countries which are not working towards climate action in such a scenario even the wto taxation rules might undergo a change and in the future it's possible that countries that are abiding by climate action targets might start imposing carbon border levies or taxes on the other countries which are not following them because see currently under the wto rules the usage of taxes on environmental grounds has been excluded in order to ensure that it doesn't become a burden on the developing and underdeveloped nations and also to ensure that environmental grounds are not misused by the developed nations to target the developing and the underdeveloped nations with higher tariffs however these wto rules might undergo changes if countries of the european union start adopting carbon taxes so in the midst of these ongoing changes in the world of climate change and climate negotiations it's very very important for india to ensure that it defends its core national interests and even though we live in a non ideal world india will have to push towards climate justice and ensure that the concept of historical responsibilities is never forgotten because see india is currently the second most populous nation in the world and very soon it's going to become the most populous nation in the world plus the country is still facing severe developmental challenges with regard to its socio economic goals and in order to achieve them and deliver socio economic justice to its citizens india will have to preserve its carbon space and policy space 
Now, this is a valid argument because India is neither responsible for historical emissions nor India's per capita emissions are very high. In fact, India has a phenomenal record in this regard. And amongst the major economies, it has one of the lowest per capita emissions, which hardly stands at around 2 tons of CO2 per year. Compared to India's per capita emissions, the per capita emissions of the United States is close to 20 tons. And this clearly highlights the stark divide between developing nations like India and the developed nations like the United States. This clearly shows that there is still enough carbon space left for India in order to develop its economy and achieve its socio-economic goals. And as the global narrative around climate change negotiations is undergoing a change, it is very important for India to leverage its unique position in order to protect and preserve its carbon space in the interest of climate justice and fairness. We cannot forget the fact that India has shown remarkable progress with regard to the adoption of clean and renewable forms of energy. And in fact, amongst all the major powers, India has given the biggest possible push and very quickly India is emerging as a global leader in the field of clean and renewable energy. But at the same time, considering our developmental needs and high population, we need to preserve our right to burn fossil fuels for a few more decades, even as we continue adopting renewable forms of energy at a very rapid pace. So India's climate change diplomacy will need to focus on these goals and protect its carbon space and policy space in order to ensure that India's developmental interests are not compromised, especially by the developed nations. Now let's take up an article from page number 10 that deals with the Rohingya refugees and India's policy towards them. According to this article, a petition has been filed in the Supreme Court seeking the release of a few Rohingya refugees who have been reportedly detained in Jammu. And according to reports, some of these Rohingya refugees have been detained by India with the intention of possibly deporting them back to Myanmar. See, the Rohingyas are an ethnic Muslim minority found in the Rakhine state of Myanmar. This minority Muslim community has faced decades of persecution and oppression at the hands of Myanmar's government and army along with the support of radical Buddhists in the Buddhist majority nation. Historically, the Rohingyas were from the Chittagong and Cox Bazar area of today's Bangladesh and over the course of time, they had migrated into the Rakhine state of today's Myanmar and they had settled over here. But since several decades, Myanmar has discriminated against the Rohingyas and it has not only rendered them stateless, but it has even carried out persecution and oppression and reportedly has even enabled communal targeting of the Rohingyas by the radical Buddhists with the support of the army. See, back in the 1400s, the Rohingyas, they migrated to the Rakhine state from the Chittagong Cox Bazar area. And this community, which was predominantly a trading community, settled in the Arakan kingdom, which was an independent coastal kingdom back in those days. But the region of Burma around it was always Buddhist dominated. And even through the colonial times, the Rakhine state served as the home for the Rohingya Muslims. But following independence, there was a military coup in Myanmar in the 1960s. And under the rule of the military junta, the Rohingya minorities were discriminated and persecuted in the Rakhine state. This primarily happened because the military dictatorship was looking for political support from the radical Buddhist elements in order to continue its autocratic rule over the country. But some of the radical Buddhist elements were hostile to the Rohingyas and they used their influence with the military junta to render the Rohingyas stateless in the 1960s. Through a series of discriminatory policies, their citizenship was taken away by the Myanmar government and following this began a campaign of state-sponsored communal violence against the minority community. Because from the 1960s itself, Myanmar started claiming that Rohingyas are not part of Myanmar and they weren't even recognized as one of the official ethnic groups of the country. Their citizenship was taken away and Myanmar said that Rohingyas are the responsibility of Bangladesh as they historically belonged to the Chittagong Cox Bazar area. While the modern state of Bangladesh and then East Pakistan refused to claim responsibility for the Rohingyas, a targeted violent campaign began against the Rohingyas from the 1970s itself. This led lakhs of Rohingya refugees 
to flee into neighboring Bangladesh and seek refuge. And throughout the last three to four decades, they have been the victims of communal riots and state sponsored violence at the hands of Myanmar army and radical Buddhist elements. Recently, in 2012, 2016, and 2017, there was large scale targeted violence against the Rohingyas, and it resulted in the exodus of refugees to several countries in the region, including Bangladesh, India, Thailand, Malaysia, Pakistan, and several other countries around the world. Even though India has never officially accepted the Rohingyas as refugees, over the decades, several Rohingyas have crossed over into India. And in the last four decades, the Indian government did not take a hostile policy against them, largely on humanitarian grounds. Because according to the United Nations and several human rights organizations, the Rohingyas are the world's most persecuted community. And the targeted violence against them, with the support of the government of Myanmar, has been referred to as ethnic cleansing, genocide and crime against humanity. So considering the scale of targeted violence against them, on humanitarian grounds, India usually hadn't adopted a hostile policy against them and as a result, a few thousand Rohingya refugees had crossed over into India. According to data available with the Ministry of Home Affairs, around 40,000 Rohingya refugees can be found in India, including in parts of Jammu and Kashmir, in and around Delhi, in Hyderabad, and as well as in several parts of Northeast India. So until the latest Rohingya humanitarian crisis witnessed in 2016-2017, India was not hostile to the Rohingyas, and even though we hadn't officially given them the refugee status, many of them had managed to cross over into India in order to seek asylum and save themselves from violence back home in the Rakhine state. But from 2016-2017 onwards, India has more or less adopted a hostile policy towards the Rohingya refugees, and this has come into question, even leading to criticism of India's policies towards the Rohingyas. During this period, as the refugee crisis erupted, and as the scale of violence increased in the Rakhine state, thousands of refugees they spilled over into Bangladesh and India. And at this point, India decided to block the entry of Rohingya refugees. And India said that it can no longer take in the Rohingya refugees as they could represent a possible security threat to India. Because the victims of Rohingya communal violence have set up a terrorist outfit known as ARSA or the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army to target Myanmar's army and the radical Buddhists in Myanmar. Reportedly, this terror outfit of the Rohingyas has connections with the lashkar e taiba the Al-Qaeda and even possibly with Pakistan's ISI. And since India generally has good relations with the Myanmar army and since we have never criticized the Myanmar army for its persecution of the Rohingyas, India could possibly become a lucrative target for the ARSA. At the same time, India is the birthplace of Buddhism and hence the Buddhist pilgrimage sites in India could also be a target for the ARSA. While these security concerns are absolutely legitimate, but the labeling of the entire community that to the most persecuted community as a security threat led to severe criticism and India had even announced back then that it will start identifying the existing Rohingyas in the country and start deporting them back to Myanmar. So this hostile approach that India was suddenly taking towards the Rohingyas was met with a lot of criticism from the United Nations and several global organizations and as well as from India's Supreme Court and the National Human Rights Commission and human rights activists in the country. See, one of the most controversial decisions of India has been to identify the Rohingya refugees and to possibly deport them back into Myanmar. In this context, recently there have been a few reports that few Rohingya refugees in Jammu have been possibly detained by the security forces and most likely they might be deported. Based on these reports, a few activists have approached the Supreme Court to intervene and ensure their release in the interest of protecting their basic human rights. However, if India were to carry out this policy of deportation, then India would be violating a key principle of international law known as the principle of non-refoulement. The principle of non-refoulement is considered as a fundamental principle under international law. And according to this principle, those who are seeking asylum or refuge in a particular country, they cannot be forcefully deported or sent back to their country where they could still face the risk of violence by the other state which is receiving these asylum seekers or refugees. If this particular state that is receiving the refugees, if it forcefully deports them or sends them back to the same place where they still face the risk of violence, 
that this state would be violating the principle of non refoulement now india has defended its policy by stating that it's not a party to the 1951 refugee convention or to the 1967 protocol to the refugee convention this convention and protocol places a set of obligations on the countries that are a party to it and it also accords a set of rights to the refugees and also places few obligations on them but india has never signed or ratified the 1951 refugee convention or the 1967 protocol and hence india has claimed that it has no obligation under this international convention while this argument of india holds good india cannot deny the fact that it has much larger obligations under the universal declaration of human rights of 1948 india is a signatory and a party to the universal declaration of human rights and as a responsible member of the united nations it is obligated to protect human rights under the un charter and abide by the fundamental principle of international law which is the principle of non refoulement even though if it is not a party to the refugee convention and the 1967 protocol then even if you look at india's own constitution article 21 that guarantees right to life applies equally not just for citizens but for foreigners as well and along with this india has a long history of accepting refugees in the region irrespective of their religion race or ethnicity be it the refugees from tibet or from sri lanka or from east pakistan or even from afghanistan india has a long tradition of accepting refugees especially those who are facing very difficult circumstances on humanitarian grounds in order to protect their human rights in the past india had been open to rohingya refugees as well but the sudden reversal in india's policy attracted a lot of criticism both at the global level and as well as within the country now let's take up another article from page number 10 which provides us an important update on india's ongoing space cooperation with some major powers such as japan italy and australia see the space agencies of india and japan that is isro and jaxa respectively they have a long history of cooperation over the years they have signed several agreements and they have worked together on several projects and recently both the space agencies have reviewed their joint cooperation following this review both the space agencies have agreed to continue their cooperation in earth observation lunar cooperation and satellite navigation they have even signed an agreement to work together in the field of space situational awareness which is critical for manned space missions and they have even committed to take up professional exchange programs in order to provide for greater interaction between their respective space scientists they have also signed an agreement to jointly study the rice crop area in their countries and to carry out air quality monitoring by using satellite data then more importantly india and japan are jointly working on a lunar mission known as the lupex mission lupex stands for lunar polar exploration mission and this mission is slated for 2024 under this mission isro and jaxa are jointly developing a lander and a rover that they intend to land at the lunar south pole then with italy just a few days back several agreements were signed to promote space cooperation in the field of earth observation space science and space robotics and as well as human space exploration and last month with australia india has signed an mou for space cooperation to build upon the comprehensive strategic partnership that they have established india's isro is even exploring the possibility of setting up tracking infrastructure in australia in order to track the gaganyaan mission which is all set to be india's first manned space flight mission now let's take up another article from page number 10 according to this article a petition has been filed in the supreme court against wrongful prosecution the petitioner has sought the supreme court to order the government to frame guidelines for providing compensation to the victims of wrongful prosecution see wrongful prosecution arises largely because of police misconduct where they usually file false cases in order to cover up for their flaws in their investigation such false cases results in the wrongful prosecution of the accused and it results in their unjustified incarceration as a result of which they might have to spend years together in jail for crimes that they have never committed in the first place in any modern democracy there is enough protection against such wrongful prosecution 
and if such incidents were to happen there will be a legal or a statutory mechanism that provides compensation to the victims and provides for their rehabilitation but unfortunately in india there is no legal mechanism to deal with wrongful prosecution and the victims are not entitled to any compensation and even the police and the prosecution they are never held accountable for their wrong doings it is said that such deliberate police misconduct especially the practice of filing false cases and taking them up for wrongful prosecution is usually targeted against certain communities based on the religion caste social status etc and the failure of the legal system to hold the police accountable for such misconduct could destroy the very social fabric of the country plus moreover such false cases and wrongful prosecution will also overburden the judiciary which is already dealing with a huge backlog of cases and more importantly it results in the violation of the fundamental rights of the victims and ends up completely destroying their future so following the bablu chauhan case in 2017 the delhi high court had ordered the law commission of india to examine wrongful prosecution and suggest comprehensive recommendations for providing relief and rehabilitation to the victims of wrongful prosecution accordingly the law commission came out with the 277th report in 2018 and it referred to wrongful prosecution clearly as a miscarriage of justice and it provided a set of recommendations to provide for relief and rehabilitation to the victims but unfortunately the government has not acted on these recommendations of the law commission and hence a petitioner has approached the supreme court to direct the government to frame guidelines for compensating the victims whose rights have been compromised due to wrongful prosecution and even to hold the police and the prosecution accountable for their misconduct now finally let's take up a couple of mains practice questions the first question climate negotiations are not just about the environment and human well being but they are also about global governance hence new delhi has to leverage its green commitment to ensure carbon and policy space for its developmental aspirations illustrate the second question the un has labeled the rohingyas as the world's most persecuted community in this context examine the plight of the rohingyas and india's policy towards them kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below so this concludes our discussion for the day thanks for watching